Um, well, welcome everyone. I see that we're still coming in from the lobby and please join us. Um, I'd like to say good morning to all of you, to our panelists and to our audience today. I am Susan Sherrick and I'm the director of the Center of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Seton Hall University. I am your moderator for the Diversity Employment and Cybersecurity Opportunities for Women and Minorities panel. This is going to be an exciting 50 minutes of discussion with four amazing cybersecurity professionals. They're going to speak about what it's like to work in cybersecurity and how you can follow in their footsteps. Here's the best news. Our panelists tell me that it's never been a better time for women and minorities to seek cybersecurity careers. So that's something we definitely want to hear about too. So please let me introduce our panelists. Denise, Verdicchio, Senior Vice President, Public Sector Sales, SHI International. Carissa Barma, Chief Information Security Officer, Old Mutual Insurance in Cape Town, South Africa. Alberta Carenza, a computer scientist in cybersecurity at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And Mandy Galante, Cybersecurity Educator, Consultant, and Training Specialist for the New Jersey Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell. Welcome, panelists. Each of you is going to spend about five or six minutes telling us who you are, what your company does, and how you became interested in cybersecurity, including your educational backgrounds, which are very diverse. As moderator, I will then ask you a few questions and then we will open up for Q&A. Audience members, please, if you have a question, just drop it in the chat and I will read your questions to the panelists so that they can answer them. So let's get started. Denise, please um, tell us about your job at SHI International and then we'll move on to Carissa, Alberta and Mandy. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Susan. It's so great to be here. I'm, I feel very honored to have the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Um, I think I am going to be the one that rounds out this panel as my story or my journey is more broadly based in IT with a cyber focus in it as well. Um, my career in IT started accidentally. I graduated Rutgers University with as Susan mentioned, a bachelor's of psychology and a bachelor's of sociology. So liberal arts major at your finest. I took a job with SHI starting two days after I graduated at Rutgers, and it was just a customer service role. I was just looking to earn some money so that I could go back to school and continue my education. And at the time, SHI was a small woman-owned company doing a little less than $1 million in revenue located right here in New Jersey. Um, and we had about 80 people, 80 employees. I had approached my job search with a pretty much, I'll do anything for money except for sales attitude. Um, but during my initial year at SHI, I discovered that technology was fascinating. Um, of course, back in 1995, when I graduated, it was still really just starting to become a part of our everyday. Uh, I, I was given a BlackBerry. I had never had, really had a cell phone before. You know, we were doing some more things, some more of our day-to-day -day tasks on the internet, but it was all really just burgeoning at the time. Um, and I just discovered that it was fascinating and there was so much to learn and that I could do sales because it was really not as scary or as hardcore as I had originally had in my head. Um, it was more about forming good relationships. And so Based on that, I took a promotion and actually went into a full sales role. And here we are 26 years later, and we're now almost a $12 billion company. And I run the public sector business unit. So think of schools. In fact, Seton Hall is a great customer of ours um, and government entities and healthcare throughout the country. It's about a three and a half billion dollar business that I run. So um, we are, SHI is the largest woman-owned, minority-owned company in the country. So it's an exciting place to work as a woman and as a minority um, to be led by somebody who is an entrepreneur and, re and really breaking ground her entire career, the entire 30 years that she's been the owner of SHI. I don't think of myself as being in the cyber field very specifically, unlike the peers on the panel today. I consider myself more of an IT general, generalist, if you will. That said, SHI provides security solutions to our customers. And so 
based on that, I have to have some ownership and accountability of understanding what that cyber market looks like, not only from a problem standpoint, what problems are our customers trying to solve, but from a solution standpoint, what can we do with IT to help them fix those problems? Um, so I've had a good, spent a good deal of time educating myself directly in the cyber field through lectures, conferences, certificate programs, reading, a lot of reading, um, listening to peers, talking to partners. Um, so I have developed my cyber expertise, if you will, just understanding through my own sort of self-education. I never went back to school to develop any of that. And I would just suggest to you that your, um, your degree that you come out as an undergrad is a great place to build. And we know that there's a lack of talent right now. So companies are more willing than ever to train employees to do the jobs um, that they need them to do. So I would like to just encourage people not to just sit themselves out of the market just because their degree didn't or wasn't in a, a technical field. There's a lot of entry points to get where you're going. What I love about the cyber part of my job is the constantly changing landscape. Everything about it is constantly changing. The problems are changing, the solutions are changing, the players in the market are changing. And to me, this just keeps me energized and challenged. And I like the fact that we are really making a very positive impact on our customers. For us in the public sector, government, schools, hospitals, um, you know, being a part of their cyber journey means we are impacting students, constituents, and patients, their safety, the safety of their data, you know, their, sometimes their physical safety. So for me, those are the things that really bring joy to that part of my job. Great. Denise, Great. thank you so much. And um, I'd like to point out something. Denise makes cybersecurity for women and minorities sound easy because her company is a trailblazer in this area, but truly only about 20% of the cybersecurity workforce is comprised of women and minorities. Um, but as our panelists will tell you, the good news is that that is changing and there's never been a better time for women and minorities to get involved. And now I'd like to move to Carissa. And Carissa, we're all really interested to hear about cybersecurity in South Africa. Um, so please enlighten us. Thanks so much, Susan. Um, and Denise, your story was just absolutely fascinating. I just love hearing how people get into cybersecurity because there's always such diverse parts um, and it's always just exciting to, to hear different stories. Um, my story started, um, I'll start when I was 18. Um, I got on a plane for the first time, went from South Africa all the way to Asia because um, I'd gotten a bursary to study um, a specialist degree in IT. Um, in Africa at that point in time, there weren't highly specialized degrees in technology. Um, and I'd gone over to Asia to do a software engineering degree. Um, at that point in time, I was convinced that I would come out and write some brilliant code um, and really become a software engineer in every way, shape or form. Uh, and coming back from Malaysia after spending four years in Malaysia, um, I joined uh, one of the biggest telecommunication companies in South Africa. Um, and the head of cybersecurity then said to me, no, you're coming into cyber. And I shouted and I screamed and I said, I don't want to do cybersecurity. I want to do software engineering through a little bit of a tantrum. And he said to me, no, you're coming into cyber. So he saw something in me that I obviously didn't see in myself. Um, and to be honest, it was one of the greatest things that has ever happened in my career. I've spent my entire career in cybersecurity. I've done basically every role there is to do in cybersecurity. Um, I'm currently the Chief Information Security Officer um, of All Mutual Limited. Um, we're the largest um, insurer on the African continent. Uh, we also have banking within the group. We're in 13 African markets. Um, and it's been an amazing journey. I mean, very similar to Denise, I love the fact that every day is different. Every day is a new challenge. Um, if, you know, no day uh, going into the office is going to be mundane. Uh, it's completely different every day. And the people you deal with are so diverse. You deal completely, um, you know, cross organization wide. You, it, there's very few roles where you really have the ability to influence every single person in an organization. And cyber is definitely one of those roles where you can 
really have very diverse conversations. Um, the one day you're speaking to the marketing teams, the next day you're speaking to deep core uh, technical people, you're speaking to executives, you're speaking to boards. It really stretches you, it really challenges you to be able to navigate relationships in very diverse ways. Um, and I think the one thing I really love about it is there's very few careers that you can really feel like you are contributing to society so meaningfully. You're really safeguarding people, you're safeguarding their belongings, you're safeguarding their lives, you're safeguarding what's important to them. And during the COVID pandemic, working for an insurer, um, we were safeguarding people's dignity. I mean, you could imagine um, when a love, loved one passes away, you want to be able to bury that person with respect. You want to be able to have a good life assurance policy that um, you know helps that family, if the breadwinner has has passed away, survive. Um, and so there's a great sense of responsibility in the job that I have um, to our customers um, to be able to keep their uh, interests safe. Um, and it's very rewarding to be able to do a job that um, impacts people so meaningfully. Um, and that's what that has kept me in cyber, you know, for um, probably about close to 17 years now. Um, and, and I've never gotten bored once. Um, I think Denise made a really good point about continuous learning. So my background is technology. But if you think about um, the one thing that I think my degree really taught me is when I went into university, it obviously changed not just countries, but continents. Um, mm -hmm. and, and it taught me to really expect change. Um, when I started off, um, cell phones were, you know, really for the privileged few. And when it ended, it was pretty much a necessity. Everybody had a cell phone. And just that drastic change of adoption of technology has just continued exponentially throughout my career. And so really what my degree prepared me for is this understanding that continuous learning and continuous adaptation is the name of the game in cybersecurity. So go out there and get a great degree, whatever it is you choose to do. And obviously a technology degree will help you. But I have hired people that have marketing degrees. Uh, I have hired people that have a background in um, the, the army or the navy because they're really great tactical thinkers, very calm in a crisis. So while it does give you a leg up, it doesn't mean it's a barrier to entry. Um, so you can still self-study, you can still um, you know, improve your, your skills, um, even if you haven't focused on a major that deals with cybersecurity. Obviously, it will give you a leg up to have that major. Um, and I think the last thing I'll leave you with about uh, education is that um, that continuous learning just goes on throughout your career. I mean, Denise spoke about the self-study. Um, whether you've got the technology background or the non-technology background, it's so critical to understand that that's actually what keeps you on the top of your game, um, keeping your, your, your knowledge refreshed continuously. Uh, great. Carissa, thank you so very much for an interesting very interesting speech. Now, what's interesting to me is what I've heard from you and Denise, as well as Gurdip uh, Kaur, our um, keynote speaker, is that why if this is a field involved in technology, you speak about how it's all about people, which uh, that's what it seems to come down to. And now I'd like to ask Alberto to uh, chime in here and what's interesting about coming from the FBI is when you read all those newspaper headlines about cyber criminals. Well, Al Alberto is one of the cybersecurity professionals on our side, one of the good guys who are tracking down the bad actors in cybersecurity. So Alberto, please tell us about what it's like working for the FBI in cybersecurity. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Susan, for the uh, introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so as you as you mentioned, I work for the FBI, and uh, so my story uh, is a little bit different with my background. Uh, when I was in high school, uh, you know, I decided at the time, like, I want to do something special with my life. I want to do something, you know, and I was thinking at the time, like, oh, you know, I want to do sports, I want to do actor or something like that. But then I realized later on, like, you know, I want to go places, go somewhere. So I decided to join the military. Uh, as soon as I graduated high school at the age of 18, I joined the United States Marine Corps and I was able to travel around the world. I was able to travel around Japan. I was able to travel around Germany. I traveled the world quite uh, with the uh, with the military. Uh, around that time, 9-11 happened. So 
Uh, there was a lot of conflict in our country, as you may, you know, as you know. So I had to, I had to deploy to Iraq during uh, 2003. So that's when I realized how computers were critical to the mission and the military specifically. So that's something that is still I learned, and I was like, you know what? It's something that I want to go into. Maybe when I decide to leave my service, go into college and learn about that. So. When I left the service, I went to school. I went to Stockton University here in New Jersey. Uh, I'm not sure if we have some people in attendance, but I graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science and information system from Stockton University. Uh, at the same time, I was actually working at one of the casinos in Atlantic City, New Jersey. We have Caesars uh, Casino and Hotel, and I was able to get started there working in IT. So I do also have an IT background. Uh, that's how I really started getting into computers with a T background. And then I realized how critical cybersecurity uh, was in this field. And then uh, fortunately, you know, going back to my government service, I felt that, you know, I wanted to do something back, go give something back to the country. So uh, I started to apply for the FBI. And many people don't realize this, but the FBI is open for everybody. Uh, obviously, you have to have you have to be a U.S. citizen to be able to apply. Uh, but anybody with a background and you know, specifically with computer science, uh, there um, the demand is there. The FBI is looking for those people with those backgrounds. But not only on cybersecurity or IT, also accounting. Uh, you can have a psychology degree as well. Just like one of our panelists here, I know I actually have some coworkers. They have a background as a psychologist, and they're working here in uh, in our cyber squads. So um, I started with the FBI back in 2010, and I've been with the Cyber Task Force for about 11 years. So uh, my title is, is is a computer scientist. So what does a computer scientist do? Uh, pretty much, I do digital forensics. I do network analysis malware reverse engineering so when you hear of uh, viruses so i kind of go in there and see what the virus what does the malware does uh once it uh it's in the network or it's in your computer what is it trying to do what is it trying to steal your your data your files or is it just uh capturing your key uh, your keystrokes that kind of thing so i do the reverse engineering for the malware uh, but I also help, I do uh, online undercover operations. So as many of you, you have heard, the dark web and stuff like that, dark forums, the criminals, you know, cyber criminals, where do they hang out? So I also work on doing online undercover ops and programming. Uh, you know, as you guys are aware, technology changes all the time. So sometimes we don't have the tools to be able to analyze any of the data. So we have to create our own tools. So uh, programming background is very important. I know we have a software engineer and uh, one of our panelists, and I'm actually, I learned programming when I was in college, but I, I kind of don't like it. <laughs> but it was it's, a, it's, it's something that you need to have, something you need to do when it comes to cybersecurity, because it's just technology changes so quickly. You know, every year something new happens. And uh, here we actually have to create our own tools sometimes. Uh, but uh, going back to the cyber task force, what does the FBI does overall? We investigate criminal uh, cyber investigations, whether it's criminal or national security. Um, a lot of our uh, investigations, they take us, it's worldwide. A lot of our you know, cyber criminals, they're not necessarily here in the US. They can be anywhere in the world. Um, and then one of, for example, one of the investigations that we do is like credit card fraud, data breaches, ransomwares, that's like the biggest thing nowadays, uh, insider threats, espionage, all those uh, kind of uh, cyber threats that you can think of, the FBI is actually um, responsible to investigate here in the US. But we also work with partners overseas. So we definitely, I, I know I work with uh, uh, British uh, intelligence. I work with uh, the French. Uh, I know we actually have worked with some African countries as well. And in Nigeria and Ghana, I actually have reached out to some of their law enforcement counterparts over there. Uh, it's just worldwide. The cyber, you know, uh, security is a worldwide thing. It's not just countries. Um, you know, you have to, you stop thinking about countries. You've got to start thinking about the world, the continents, because is uh technology is a great thing now you know we can communicate with people 
all over the world in a split second. So, uh, but that's the stuff that I do. And uh, one of the things I would say, and uh, again, um, just like what the other panelists says, is like continuing education. Um, don't be afraid to try to get into cybersecurity. Some people, when they hear cybersecurity, they think like, oh, you have to be so smart. You have to know about technology so much. Uh, no, there's entry levels. I mean, if when you come in, when you you know as an entry per level person, we expect you not to know much because technology changes. It's just that you just have to be motivated, motivated to learn. That's all it is because and continue education because something that you learn today doesn't really apply next year or the year after. So uh, we just want you to be uh, willing to, to learn and, and apply, uh, especially with us here in the FBI. Um, we don't have that many people apply, whether they're women. It just they believe that the FBI is, 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 is unreachable. But I could t I'm sitting here telling you that is reachable, uh, whether you're a minority or a woman. Uh, it's just you have to be willing to apply. Um, Alberto, thank you so much. But before we end with you, um, can you tell us um, that isn't now if someone wants an internship, they should start thinking of applying right now because don't you have that extra component there of um, of security? So if you could just pl plug your internships right now, that we would be very appreciative. Sure, sure. Um, so we do have an internship. We have an honors internship with the FBI, which is great. It's actually a paid internship. So um, the the only requirements that we have with working with FBI is even though as an intern, you will have to go through a thorough background check. So you would actually as an intern, you would have a security clearance uh, when you come in. So that takes quite a while. It takes a couple of months to go through that. So the um, internship application process is actually it opened up in September and it's actually closing right now, I believe uh, this weekend. Um, and it's it's early. Usually internships, you know, they don't start the process until January. But with us, because you have to go through the background checks and you have to get a security clearance, we do it early. I did post uh, on the on the Hoover app, I believe on the I, I posted that up for the students. So if they're willing to go and, and apply right now, uh, I highly suggest you get on it like today because the uh, I believe it's the, the the deadline is I believe is, is in two days. So um, like I said, it's, it's definitely um, a paid internship. And then you're actually working right next to me, right next to the uh, agents. Uh, and we are actually give you true investigations. We'll actually will give you data that is part of it and you will be um, producing and you know whether it was digital forensics and now you you will be contributing to the to the FBI mission and um, and not only that but uh, you will get a security clearance and then once you graduate college you will be set to work for the government. Great Alberto thank you so much and now speaking of government I'd like to introduce Mandy Galante. Mandy works for the main cybersecurity unit of uh, the state of New Jersey. So Mandy, please tell us about what New Jersey is doing. And specifically, Mandy has so much great information for students about how they can get experience um, to get those wonderful cybersecurity jobs. So welcome, Mandy. Well, thank you so much. It's been fascinating to listen to the other stories of our, my co-presenters. Um, I have uh, definitely a different journey um, as uh, Susan said, I work for the New Jersey Kick, which is the New Jersey Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Cell. And we like to say that our mission is as a one stop shop to protect the government, the organizations, private or public, and the citizens of New Jersey. So that's our common theme, I think, today is protection, right? And I, I hope that's motivating most of the attendees today uh, because cybersecurity is truly a threat to our society. So uh, uh, we, my role is as the education and training. My focus is on either doing talks to help people understand best practices uh, or to bring awareness of cybersecurity to students and maybe people who are transitioning their careers. How did I get here? It was a really weird journey. 
Um, I was actually an international business finance major and ended up on Wall Street when I got out of college. Left Wall Street when I became a parent and then came back into the workforce by going to for some certifications. I discovered I was a techie and I got my certification so that I could be a network administrator and spent several years doing that job. But then the I love you virus hit. For any of you who are old enough to remember that, that meant that I had to work 24 seven and that didn't really jive with being a mom. So instead I left that uh, that 24 seven type job I love tech, so I kind of missed it, but I was given the opportunity to teach. I was brought into our local high school to be a network teacher. I taught computer systems, break, fix, that sort of thing. And my students really enjoyed my class um, and then came to me one day and they said, we want to have you again next year. Could you teach us how to hack? I said, no. First of all, I don't know how to hack. And secondly, that seems like a bad idea. Um, but I do think that I could figure out how to do cybersecurity instruction. Why don't we learn together? So I got my Security Plus certification as I was inventing this course for my students. And one thing led to another. 16 years later, I had been teaching cybersecurity and digital forensics and just really trying to expose as many students as I could to this concept. Did some cyber camps. And one important thing that I want to talk about later is cyber competitions. My students liked my class, but they loved competing. So there are competitions like Cyber Patriot, Cyber Start, Girls Go Cyber Start, uh, National Cyber League. I posted some things in the uh, WUVA community. What was important about that was that it, it gave students, um, Alberto, you just talked about picturing yourself in the industry, right? women, people of color, my students who come from um, from economic backgrounds that aren't advantageous and hadn't pictured themselves in a profession. Competitions or classes in cybersecurity can inspire people who don't necessarily picture themselves in this industry and say, wait a minute, I could be good at this. That, that actually happened to me. So there was my journey. I'm trying to teach these students cybersecurity. I'm, I'm, we're doing it together. And one day there was a competition uh, that was open to not only students, but to adults. And my students came to me and said, Mrs. G, what you got? You know, you, you should compete with us. So I did. I was so nervous, um, but I managed to do fairly well. And and what that led to was twenty five thousand dollars worth of SANS Institute certification courses and uh, um, certification exams, which I'm not going to tell you what my scores were, but let's just say I passed. OK, so I do have those certifications um, and what a learning experience and, and how inspiring it was. And by the way, I got to go back and say to my students, well, huh, I got it. OK, so so now sit down and listen. Um, but but those are those those journeys, you know, find find uh, what you're interested in. Um, it will transfer into cybersecurity. Um, network, go to competitions, go to conferences. All of those have been beneficial to, to me as I became an educator. And then I finally transferred um, to the SANS Institute and ran their Cyber Start, um, a Girls Go Cyber Start program, which helped me to understand even more about what it takes to have a career. Um, not because I walked the walk, well, because I focused everything that I've been doing the past two, 20 years to figuring out where are the openings and where are the pathways for students and even for people who are transitioning from a different career or maybe like myself where you came back from parenthood and you said what's new and exciting that I could do. So I hope we can talk a little bit more about those opportunities, but that's my journey and thank you for letting me share it. Denise, oh, 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 Mandy, that was fantastic. And you um, and I, before we had a pre-talk, I didn't even know that there were cybersecurity competitions. But just like with Shark Tank, you know, students are very motivated for competitions. So uh, let's talk more about resources and um, and women and give advice to women and minorities who do want to go into the profession. Mandy, you just touched upon that. Denise, I looked at your website. 
I think that there, you offer over 100 jobs in cybersecurity around the world right now. So can you, one, uh, address you know, opportunities for women and minorities, even though SHI International just really screams that anyway. Um, and, you know, what advice can you give them? What should they study? How can they apply at SHI for an internship um, or for a job? Great, thank you. Yep. I, I'd be happy to. Um, first of all, I just want to reiterate that I think there's a big misconception that cyber is only technical. So what you'll find at SHI is that a lot of our jobs are still within the IT framework, some specifically focusing on cyber, but they're not technical positions. So um, things like marketing, uh, data analysis, operations, partner support. I mean, there's just so many ways to engage in this field without actually being technical. So if you think that this is something that you want to get into, even if you want to have a career that is technical, um, you can start entry level and then learn on the job. And more companies, especially because of the talent gap, they're just they're just so willing to to train you. And SHI has a wonderful hire um, or excuse me, promote from within program. So if you start in one role and you decide, oh, I really do want to be technical you can um, apply and move into that role without necessarily having to compete so much with outside candidates, which is a really nice added benefit of working for SHI. Um, I think that um, we're, we're hiring in every single department, Susan. As you said, we have well over 100 jobs and more coming because we continue to invest in new solutions as every good cyber and IT company has to continually do. Um, and so we'll see in 2022 even more um, openings and more opportunities throughout the company. Um, we are also working on now, we have had a, a an associate position available, somewhat like an internship. It was a paid position, but we're formalizing our internship program right now. And so next year we will be launching a, a more formal internship program. And again, that internship program will allow for opportunities for experience throughout the company. So whether it is in our InfoSec, our internal cyber um, group, or whether it's in our security, um, customer facing security, pre-sales, post-sales, technical, or whether it's in uh, marketing and events or something else, you know, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for internships for the students of Seton Hall and all really throughout the country. Um, we cater to all majors. Susan, I think you asked us to talk about this. And again, I want to I want to stress that this is really important. The large majority of employees at SHI are from a liberal arts background, just like I am. Um, and we've learned on the job. We have learned through our peers. We have learned through self-education. And so there's really just so much opportunity for students ex that are still not only still exploring through our internship program, but also, you know, post-college, like, oh, I didn't realize I was going to be interested in this piece of uh, a technology field to still get into it. So it's never too late. Specifically to the women and minorities, I think, thankfully, more than ever, there is attention into making sure that we have equitable and diverse workplaces. SHI is investing in that as well. Um, we are woman-owned and um, three of our five business unit leaders are women. I'm one of, of three. And so that is, it's really a tremendous start, but it is just a start because when you look down into the organization, we do have a lot of female leaders, but when you look into the specific technical roles in the company, those are still, major, the majority of those positions are still filled by men. Um, and the, the focus, like I said, is more, more than ever in trying to get diverse um, workplaces and diverse departments within the company. And so really it's just, there's just never been a better time. There's excitement around. We're looking at programs. Um, and I know uh, Mandy, you mentioned a few of these. We were looking at programs that reach down into the K-12s that reach into the college and start developing interest and talent there so that the next generation of women and minorities come up and already have access to an interest in those fields but there's no time like the present and there is nothing to be afraid of i think alberto said it best 
Um, you don't have to come in with experience. Nobody is anticipating you doing that. Um, so just come as you are and let the company meet you where you're at and to develop your career in whatever way is right for you. Uh, Mandy mentioned she kind of took a, a wobbly path to get where she is today. And that was her perfect journey. And everyone out there has your own perfect journey. And so if you're working for the right company, they will, they will just, you know, nurture you on whatever that journey is for yourself. Great, Denise, thank you. I've, we've had a few questions come in, so please, any panelists, jump in here. Although, Alberto, I do believe the first one may be directed towards you. Um, when, I, when you um, talk about your internships, do you need to be a U.S. citizen uh, to have an internship with the FBI? Uh, yes, you do, uh, just because you are going through a, a security clearance process, so you do have to be a U.S. citizen. Uh, and when you go through these background process, uh, just for your awareness, uh, is they go back uh, almost 10 years back of your life, meaning they want to know where you travel, where you live, who are your neighbors. I mean, it's a very extensive background check. I mean, they, they, they do check, like they talk to my neighbors when they did my background check. They talk to my professors. They talk to my, uh, my bosses at work. So that was kind of... It was kind of funny when the bosses were like, hey, the FBI wants to talk to you. How about you? What's going on? And I just like, I'm just going through a, a security clearance process. But yes, they will. Uh, you need to be a U.S. citizen for that. Uh, so going into this, um, you for your awareness, uh, the FBI will check for your social media postings. So whatever you say, it's, uh, it, can, it can come back to haunt you. So it's one of those where, and it's not just the FBI, it's a lot of companies are also doing that as well. So um, whether it was 10 years ago or just last week, yeah, uh, that's one of the things is uh, social media uh, footprint. Uh, for your awareness, everybody's gonna be looking into that. So uh, be mindful of what you say out there. And uh, yeah, please apply. We need you, we want you. <laughs> Great, now we have Cameron says, I'm in school for cybersecurity right now. Should I wait to apply for an internship or a job? Uh, uh, at least for I mean, at least for me, um, you should apply for the internship. At least if when I was in school, I wish I would have applied for an internship uh, during your uh, junior year. At least with us, you can work with us in the summer, and then you know during your between your junior and your senior year. So uh, the application time will be now, but uh, I wouldn't wait. Why not? Why apply now? So uh, there's some jobs that they understand that they will they will actually bring you in and hire you before because they understand you you're about to graduate within you know a few months. They will bring you in and hire you. And one of the conditions will be make sure you get your degree. But uh, they will be more than happy to to hire you. I know we would uh, I know we would for the internship. We wouldn't hire you but I know other companies definitely would. Great, and Mandy, I think you'd like to jump in here. Thank you, Susan. Um, I absolutely agree with Alberto. Um, go ahead and apply for those internships. New Jersey Kick has our internship open for spring 22. I put the link in Mova. What's important there though is that, um, you know, school is great, but but you, you need to start getting your feet on the ground. And the internship is such a wonderful opportunity to do that. You two things happen in internship. You start to get some skills, start to get some confidence in those skills. You also in a good men in a good internship, you're going to find some mentorship, right? You're going to find that person who wants to grow your career. Um, I just did a LinkedIn uh, search for New Jersey Kick last night. I just wanted to see something because I know that at New Jersey Kick, we hire a lot of our former interns. A lot of them have started their careers there and now they're working someplace else. So I did a little search. I just put NJCCIC in there and the list of people who had it as, you know, started internship, um, original, you know, I was just, it was heartwarming to see that our commitment to growing people in this career has really uh, developed a, a history. Um, and I know that's true of the FBI. And if you're going for a good internship, you should see that often, that they've mentored you and they've helped you to get comfortable in um, what the career opportunities are. 
Great, Mandy, thank you. Now I've got a question for Carissa because Carissa hires. She is a chief information security officer. So Carissa, when you're interviewing young people just out of college, uh, maybe a few years out, or even people transitioning from another career, tell us what are the qualities above all that you look for uh, during an interview and for new hires? Um, I think for me, Susan, it's definitely passion um, and a desire to learn because I, I agree completely with the other participants. Um, I think on the job um, training will give you everything you need to be uh, everything you need to be successful. So what I really look for is a person that's willing to take opportunity and to actually invest in bringing out the best of themselves for the organization. Um, and, you know, we, we can train anyone. We can train anyone from any walk of life in from anywhere in the world. Um, you know, we can we can make a cyber expert out of pretty much anyone if they have the right attitude. So for me, attitude is the number one thing I'm looking for when I'm interviewing young people. Carissa, so interesting you should say that because Gurdeep Kaur, who is our keynote speaker, said, uh, ended her speech by saying, it's, um, at, it's um, aptitude over anything else. I'm um, not aptitude, it's attitude over aptitude that is the key to success in cybersecurity, and you just reinforced her words. So, which is really, really interesting. I've got a question that relates to women and minorities. And in fact, next week for Women Entrepreneurship Week, we're talking about confidence. A lot of times, minorities and women have been historically excluded from certain professions, and they indeed may be the first generation in their family to be going into a high level profession in cybersecurity. Um, is there a matter of confidence? Um, can you cultivate confidence? What in your own careers have you ha helped to develop confidence? And how important is that um, in when you go on an interview for cybersecurity, you're getting a certification, can you address how do you gain confidence? How do you exude confidence? And how important is that? Because you may be the first in your family or in your group to be going as a woman or a minority member into this growing, exciting field. Anyone can answer. Denise. Well, I'd be happy to start. I think that's a really great question, Susan. So I'm, I'm happy that you asked it. I think confidence is incredibly important, but it's it's important also to realize it doesn't just happen overnight, especially in a workplace, especially when you're graduating college senior and getting your first job. Um, looking through the journey of my career, it was certainly a gradual process for me to gain confidence and understand that not only am I qualified for the next job in my career ladder, but also that I deserve it. I've earned it. I mean, you know, it's it's mine because I worked so hard. And so I think that just understanding that building that confidence up is a journey is really important. Um, I think that Mandy mentioned mentorship, that if you're in an internship program, you might find a good mentor. I think that is absolutely key to helping build confidence because if you have someone who is invested in uh you know enabling you and again nurturing you and and helping you to um sometimes it's even just about bouncing like the right words off of you know you're going to go in and ask for a raise you're going to go in and ask for that new job even if you don't have all the qualifications you know that mentor will really guide you in how to navigate those things and that having that person there that is just constantly on your side that is invested in your success and your continual growth is going to help your confidence so i'd suggest that you seek out a mentor um, whether it's via an internship or when you start at a new company and you just you know you can find somebody in an up level that is willing to be a mentor you'll find that a lot of executive leaders are really interested in mentoring and developing people um, within the organization because that's the next leader. <laughs> so we are all very interested in doing that. I think to me, that's the, the number one thing about developing, developing content, confidence. If I could just say one more thing, I think as women and minorities, I obviously I can't speak as a minority, but I can speak as a woman, I, and especially in technology and especially in cyber. You'll often find that you're the only woman in the room. You know, early on in my career, I was 
quite often the only woman in the room. And some part of me had to just um, decide that it was okay for me to have a voice in that room. And once I started having that voice and getting feedback on my thoughts, opinions, perspectives, that also helped me to grow. So sometimes you just have to have a little bit of courage to just let your voice be heard and let it be heard loudly <laughs> um, and not be afraid just because you're the only woman in the room. You're the only person of color in the room. You're the only whatever it might be in the room. That doesn't matter. Let your voice be heard and you'll learn and develop and gain confidence from that alone. Great. Thank you, Thank Denise. You. Thank Any you. other Thank panelists you. like to? I'm just going to quickly just add that uh, I totally agree with uh, as a minority uh, me being here in cyber uh, with the FBI. I find myself the only Latino in the room and uh, it's kind of and it's been like that for the past 10 years, unfortunately. And it's because, you know, and, and we are being proactive in the FBI to grow diversity. So I actually for the past five years have gone to middle schools and high schools to let the kids know that the jobs are there. The opportunity is there to come to the FBI. You know, it's a misconception of law enforcement that they believe that they can apply just because they're minorities, but they can, you know, and just like it was mentioned before, everybody has a different road, but the the goal there, the, the, the door is open. And I definitely wish there would be uh, more uh, mi minorities coming in within the FBI. I, I, ha I have a co-worker too, that she is a woman and a minority and uh, within our cyber here uh, task force and throughout the country. I mean, literally there is maybe like a handful of them. And we just, we see that and we at the FBI, we see that we need more diversity and we are definitely trying to be proactive at it. And we've been doing it for years. Uh, it's just uh, just trying to put the word out there that, you know, we, the door is open and you just have to set, you know, put your foot, you know, and just step in. Great. And Carissa, I think you wanted to say something too. Yeah. Um, go ahead, just, please. I just wanted to add that I think um, everyone thinks that, you know, everyone's confident and courageous and you probably think all of us talking to you today, you know, we know everything that you used to know about cybersecurity. I just want to, the message I want to leave with you guys is nobody knows everything there is to know about cybersecurity. So when you feel like you're doubtful or you're doubting yourself, whatever your title is, whether you're the best ethical hacker in the world or you are the CISO of the biggest organizations in, in the world, none of us know everything. So all of us have self-doubt. All of us go, what do I do in this situation? All of us go, how do I navigate this? So you're not alone. Um, and, and I think just understanding that when you walk into a room, the dynamic is that no person in the in the room has all the answers. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, thank you so much. And Mandy, we're going to leave you with the last word. So um, as we're almost out of time, but I know it'll be a great last word. So please. Well, real quickly, some resources that are great. Um, uh, WESIS, the Women in Cybersecurity Organization, has a strong mentorship program that you can sign up for. You can be matched with a mentor, mentees. Those are, um, and Cyversity, which is used to be the International Consortium of Minority Professionals Cybersecurity, but now it's called Cyversity, um, has a strong program to, uh, to help people get their leg up. And the last thing I'd like to point out as a resource is the SANS Immersion Academies, free scholarships for certifications and education. So these are all things that match really well with a college student looking to enter the, their, their first career. And I hope that those are resources that you can uh, benefit from. I did post them in the WOVA community. Great, um, Mandy, Carissa, Denise, Alberto, awesome panel. I, I could keep this going. I, I don't know about you, but I could stay here for another hour. Unfortunately, our time is up. I thank you so much for generously sharing your sage advice. And this recording will be up for the next three or four months so students can watch it. We really appreciate um, your participating in this fantastic session. And I hope you'll stay and watch the, uh, for the rest of the conference. And now from 12 to 1230, we'll have a break. We'll return at 1230 for our day in the life panel. Thank you, everyone. OK, and goodbye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Sure. Bye. Bye. Bye.